All right, good, good evening, everyone. And welcome to our evening keynote for our symposium on conflict and civility in political discourse, Where's the Line? My name is Pete Damiano. I direct the University of Iowa Public Policy Center, and I'm also a professor in the College of Dentistry. And you are all here, I believe, on one hand to hear our distinguished guest, but also because you understand the importance of the topic of political discourse and how important it is for our country to be able to have that type of dialogue to move forward. Um, it's a very important part of the university. It's a very important part of the University Public Policy Center, where we're an interdisciplinary research center, and we do research to try to inform policy, not advocate for changes. But it's very important that we have policymakers that care about that information from our perspective so that you can bring people together from different perspectives, and I believe that you make better policy that way. That's the way we do our research from an interdisciplinary perspective, by bringing people together from different disciplines, different methodologies. It's the way the university works now versus people doing their solo research and sitting in their office and having solo authorship, what used to be what was most valued. Now in many of our disciplines, it's that interdisciplinary research that's very important. The question that we added to this in that subtitle about where is the line, it's because we're not here to say we know what the answer is. It's not just about being polite. The sub subtitle for this is sometimes you have to scream to be heard and that it depends on the situation. And as we've been talking about all day today and we're going to talk about tomorrow, that whether it was a civil rights movement or a women's right to vote or other kinds of things, there's been times when some people might think even if it was not necessarily violent, it was something that shouldn't have been raised in public or shouldn't have been done this way or that. And so sometimes it does need to be pushed. But on the other hand, to be able to make good policy, you have to be able to sit down, respect the person across from you, and be able to listen, and then merge those things together. And tonight we have a speaker who has lived his career doing that and has been on a tour around the country talking about that. And since he's from our area, it also makes it that much more interesting and personal and nice for him to be here. With that, I'm going to introduce Derek Willard. And Derek, I'm going to have to pull out my notes because his title is so long and I want to get it accurate, is the Special Assistant to the President for Government Relations and also the Associate Vice President for Research. And he's been a colleague from the College of Dentistry aspect for many years, as well as now in the Office of the Vice President for, for Research. Derek? Uh, thank you. You all know the rule is that the longer uh, the title, perhaps the less it is that you really have to do. Uh, and so uh, I hope that's uh, not true. But I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, thanks, too, to the University Public Policy Center for organizing this symposium on political discourse as part of its distinguished Forkenbrock series into the University Lecture Committee, the members of the Planning Committee, and all the participants and sponsors who made this happen. We have already heard of the corrosive impact that negative uh, political discourse can have on individuals and institutions. Uh, last night, we were reminded that we are not the only ones who are watching and listening. Uh, the world is watching and listening to what is happening with our governance, with our individuals and institutions uh, that we have in this country, and so are the markets. So it will have a big impact and a very real impact, not only here, uh, but around the world. It's my honor to be uh, associated with this symposium uh, for these reasons, and to introduce tonight's speaker, Mr. Jim Leach, Chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities, and to participate with the University Lecture Committee uh, at the end of my remarks to present him uh, with the notable Iowan uh, Award. Uh, prior to his appointment as NEH Chairman in August of 2009, Mr. Leach was the John L. Weinberg Visiting Professor of Public and International Affairs at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University. He also served as Interim Director of the Institute of Politics at Harvard, the John F. Kennedy uh, School of Government at Harvard University from 2007 to 2008. Previously, however, uh, he had uh, served for 15 terms 
30 years from 1977 to 2007 as a Republican member of the United States House of Representatives, representing first the first dist district, congressional district of Iowa, and subsequently after redistricting uh, the second congressional district. He rose to chair the House Banking Committee and to become a senior member of the uh, Committee on International Relations. Perhaps most prescient for tonight, though, was his founding and uh, co-chair of the Congressional Humanities Caucus. Over these years, of these years, the editors of Congressional Quarterly had this to say about him, and I'm quoting, a leech looks like a rumpled college professor and speaks in an erudite manner. His knowledge of economic theory was developed at Princeton, Johns Hopkins, and the London School of Economics. Yet Leach is one of the capital's gentler souls. He treats friend and foe alike with the same measured and polite way. And he approaches issues with more than the usual introspection. End quote. Congressional comedy, in his case, did not require the avoidance of conflict, just the opposite. He contended with issues in public life just as tenaciously as he did on the mat as a state high school wrestling champion. At the age of 31, Mr. Leach abandoned a promising career in the Foreign Service, writing a letter of resignation to protest President Nixon's firing of Special Pro Prosecutor Archibald Cox in the midst of the Congressional Watergate investigation. This act of loyal opposition was to be characteristic of a long career in which his voice could call for both consensus across party lines and loyal opposition when it counted even with his, in his own party. As a 30-year member of Congress, Mr. Leach witnessed with disappointment and a certain alarm the decline in civility on Capitol Hill. Incendiary public discourse had proliferated not only in politics, but also in the myriad forms of commentary made possible by the internet and the new social media. Instantaneous, just-in-time messaging, at times with a studied mendacity, threatened to substitute for or to overpower with sheer numbers, approaches demanding a more reasoned approach. At NEH, Chairman Leach's concern precipitated a personal nationwide tour to highlight the importance of civility in public discourse. He also called for an NEH initiative entitled Bridging Cultures, which provides funding for public forums, films, and other outreach efforts to explore the role of civility in a democracy. On May 15, 2011, 19 months after he began, Chairman Leach spoke in Hawaii, the final stop in a tour covering 80 cities and towns in all 50 states in his drive to illustrate what he called the divisive rhetoric of anger that threatened the fundamental necessity of democracy, the exchange of views. Beginning with a National Press Club speech in November of 2009, barely three months into his tenure as NEH chairman, Mr. Leach outlined some of the reasons mutual respect was breaking down across the country and warned of consequences at home and abroad. Quote, how we lead or fail to lead in an interdependent world will be directly related to how we comprehend our own history, values, diversity of experiences, and how deeply we come to understand other people. Citizenship is hard. 
It takes a willingness to listen, watch, read, and think in ways that allow the imagination to put one person in the shoes of another." End quote. At no time in history has the National Endowment for the Humanities been more important as a central steward of this comprehension and this willingness. At no time has it had a more intrepid spokesperson or compelling spokesperson for this stewardship. For all these reasons and more, I am delighted to introduce Wendy Tan from the University of Iowa Lecture Committee to present Chairman Leach with this year's notable Iowan Award. Wendy. And Mr. Leach. short. Um, good evening. My name is Wendy Tam, and on behalf of the lecture committee, I would like to present the special award to the guest of honor. The lecture committee established this notable Iowan award as a way to recognize and honor those Iowans among us who has contributed significantly not only to the University of Iowa, but the state of Iowa and to our nation. It is without a doubt that James Leach is extremely deserving of this honor. And so on behalf of the University Lecture Committee, University of Iowa, citizens of the state and our nation, I would like to present you with our humble award, the Notable Iowan Award. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Wendy, and, and thank you, good friend Derek. Uh, I'm going to do a little experiment this evening, and uh, I'm going to be talking about a little bit of economics, a little bit of civility, uh, a little bit of uh, uh, Supreme Court policy. Uh, but in doing it, I'm going to do something I've never done before, and that is I am a meat and potatoes speaker. Uh, but I thought uh, this might be a time to, to have some slides. And I had suggested in, in working with, with Pete and Derek and others uh, on this conference that's ongoing that we ought to bring some art in. And we also ought to introduce some humor. And how do you combine art and humor? And the main instrument that is a daily occurrence to everybody is the newspaper and the cartoon. And so I've gone through uh, some cartoons, uh, some from the 19th century, some recent uh, this particular one is, is actually not a cartoon. It's, it's an American artist named Roy Lichtenstein who uh, uh, uses a cartoon technique. He calls this one Crying Woman. I've added a caption to it. Uh, I'm not sure you'll understand it, but it's intended to imply that, that, that maybe it's good to listen to someone else's opinion. And my, my theory in all of this is that uh, uh, a speaker, i.e. me, uh, can make fairly ponderous comments uh, that no one remembers that listens and the speaker himself soon forgets. But uh, there are images that are stronger than comments. And to me, as I went and selected these, there are three or four that I cannot get out of my mind. And so uh, uh, someone is going to put some of these up as, as kind of a slide thing along the way, and that is the background for uh, uh, the addition to the talk, so that uh, you don't have to be all ears. Uh, uh, in any regard, I want to begin with some economics, uh, because they're uh, partially but not fully at the root of, of our problems today. And these are tough times, everyone knows it. Uh, the mood sour, uh, the Tea Party and the Occupy Wall Street movement exemplify the extent of, of, of public angst. Uh, and there's a sense that the American people have been let down by the best and the brightest in American politics and finance. 
Uh, management of debt has become the dominant problem uh, for the American family, the federal government, most states, and most communities. There's a vibrant, uh, not always well-articulated debate about how or if the economy can be stimulated from Washington. Traditional Keynesian economists suggest that when government is faced with an economic downturn or national security challenge, it should press the fiscal levers. Uh, acolytes of Milton Friedman, on the other hand, argue caution, especially on raising taxes. Both sides of the policy debate are confronted with more limited options than in the past. At some point, debt accumulation becomes unmanageable. Uh, we see this in uh, Greece today uh, and potentially uh, several other countries in Europe. No economist knows where the breaking point is because in the final measure, nation states operate in a market economy. It is public confidence that determines the marketability and the pricing of debt. What we do know is that the cost of government are bound to escalate as payment on debt obligations places an ever-increasing burden on national resources and as a higher proportion of the population reach retirement age. In addition, we know there's a hangover from the past decade fiscal decision making that can't be ducked. For the first time in our history, and quite probably any country's history, we chose to cut taxes in wartime. No shared economic sacrifice was called for. The entire cost of our foreign entanglements, the two longest wars in American history, as well as the dropping of bombs in four other countries, has been passed on to future generations. The result is that a year ago, we raised approximately 15% of the GDP in taxes and spent 25%. These are unsustainable numbers. This brings us to the increasingly surreal world of Washington politics and the fiscal decisions that affect all elements of the federal budget. And what is so troubling is the differences in judgment that are worthy of respect are exacerbated by partisanship, sometimes ideologmanship, that word's not yet in Webster's, that undercut the capacity of governing bodies even to make decisions. Too many are looking at politics as a game to win rather than a challenge to lead. As most of you are aware, the eyes of Washington are in a group of 12 legislators mandated to come up in the next few weeks with a plan to narrow the deficit at least $1.2 trillion, $1 trillion over the next decade. Many economists on both sides of the keynes friedman divide are suggesting that steeper out-year deficit reductions, $3 trillion or more, should be the goal. Such a sum will inevitably involve greater constraints on domestic discretionary spending, which, by the way, are already at the lowest level in relationship to the GDP uh, in modern times. But they can only realistically be achieved by also reforming entitlement programs, i.e. Social Security and health care costs, and or raising greater revenue, perhaps to the 18.5% GDP range that hallmarked the 1980s. Under President Reagan, the last president to modify the underpinnings of Social Security, a combination approach was taken. The age of retirement was gradually raised. The formula for cost of living raises was suggested slightly downward. And the income levels in which Social Security taxes are levied were moved upwards. The judgment in Congress and the executive branch at the time was that this combination approach entailed fair and balanced sacrifice on the part of working Americans and their employers who share the burden of paying Social Security taxes and retirees who depend on the dedicated transfer of dollars, of tax dollars. Of all our challenges, the retirement income aspect of Social Security remains the most manageable. Unfortunately, in today's political climate, it's unclear whether a balanced effort akin to that kind arrived at in the Reagan Tip O'Neill era can be repeated. The bigger fiscal tr trauma is health care, a subject upon which I am far from an expert. But it is self evident that there are equity problems in health care delivery and that there is a lack of discipline in health care cost that is weakening the overall economy. 
We are the only country in the world in which the health care costs are a double digit percentage of the GDP, now approaching 17%, which contrasts starkly with the 5% of GDP figure which health care represented when John F. Kennedy assumed office. I mention this subject in these figures because when defense spending and interest in the national debt are excluded, it is Social Security and health care that principally drive the cost of the federal budget, and it is Medicaid that is the single most bedeviling element in the appropriations process of most state governments. I also mention it because many businessmen will tell you that it is health care costs rather than salary considerations that often drive corporate decisions to outsource jobs. These seemingly extraneous macroeconomic considerations are noted to underscore the fragility of our fiscal picture. Most citizens assume, uh, and rightly I believe, that America will get through uh, this period of job stagnation and come, become strong again if we simply get back to our roots and regain our optimism. The humanities may be central to this prospect. One of the myths of our time is that humanities are good for the soul, but irrelevant to the pocketbook. Actually, they're central to long-term American competitiveness. It is true that many jobs, such as in the building trades, are skill-based, but job creation itself requires an understanding of community and the world. Change and its acceleration hallmark the times. With each passing year, jobs evolve, become more sophisticated. Trading for one skill set may be of little assistance for another. On the other hand, studies that stimulate the imagination and nourish capacities to analyze and think outside the box are well suited to the challenges of change. They make coping with the unprecedented a manageable endeavor. What is needed in a world in flux is a new understanding of the meaning of the basics in education. Traditionally, the basics are about the three R's, which in Iowa City are sometimes defined as reading, writing, and wrestling. But however defined, they're critical. Nonetheless, they are insufficient. What are also needed are studies that provide perspective on our times and foster citizen understanding of their own communities, other cultures, and the creative process. To understand and compete in the world, we need a fourth R, what for lack of a precise moniker might be described as reality, which includes not only relevant knowledge of the world near and far, but the imaginative capacity to put oneself in the shoes of others and creatively apply knowledge to discrete endeavors. Rote thinking is the hallmark of the status quo. Stimulating the economy is the key to the future. Stimulating the imagination is the key to the future. As individuals, we all try to make sense of our own odysseys through life. Our universe is small in relation not only to the solar system, but the communities in which we live. But wherever we might be, we're affected by global events, whether related to the challenges of national security or the global hiring hall. In this insecure geostrategic environment, a deeper understanding of the fourth R has never been more important. It is essential to revitalizing the American productive engine, to defining and inspiring citizenship. A skeptic once suggested that the humanities are little more than studies of flaws in human nature. Actually, they uplift on the one hand and warn on the other. The power of a few to commit acts of societal destruction and the contrasting capacity of a few to precipitate uplifting change has grown exponentially in the past century. Two contrasting examples provide contemporary illustrations. As our Nafisi, the author of Reading Lolita in Tehran, points out, that little strikes greater fear in the hearts of despots than the humanities. They are anathema to tyrants because they liberate the mind. It is not surprising that in the wake of civil unrest several years ago, Muhammad Ahmadinejad declared that humanities courses in Iran must be purged to reflect only government-approved dogma. To watch what appears to be an historic progressive revolution take shape in Cairo's Tahir Square this past year is to understand why oppressors have such reason to fear the humanities. To them, the danger is self-evident. A free-thinking people will be tempted to 
to lead their leaders. One liberated mind, a young college graduate named Gigi Ibrahim, was interviewed on The Daily Show about why she became involved in the protests against her government. The answer she gave John Stewart was that she was inspired by taking a class at the American University in Cairo on social issues and reform movements. Ideas manifested themselves into ideals, and history she found provided the power of example. Individuals with convictions could stand up to tyranny. Precedents can be instructive, but less so in the world in which we live has so many unprecedented problems political as well as economic. Civilization, for instance, is on trial from two extremes. The looming prospect that weapons of mass destruction could be unleashed and the reality that the more advanced and open a society, the more vulnerable it is to terrorism. Seldom, therefore, has it been more important for individuals in public life to appeal to the better angels rather than the baser instincts of the body politic. Whether the issues are social or economic, domestic or international, the temptation to appeal to the darker side of human nature must be avoided. The stakes are too high. The duty of public officials is to inspire hope rather than to manipulate fear. fear. The health of nations is directly related to the temperance of statecraft. It's also related to the depth of knowledge applied to decision making. This is no time to put the brakes on humanity studies or toy with anti-intellectualism. In reviewing, for example, our decision to go to war in Iraq, it's apparent that inadequate attention to cultural issues may have cost lives as well as money. Yes, there was an intelligence failure related to misjudgment about Iraq's nuclear capabilities. But the greatest intelligence fa failure was our lack of understanding of the region, its people, and their religions. For instance, having gone to war in the Persian Gulf a decade earlier, Congress and executive branch decision makers understood little of the Sunni-Shia divide when 9-11 hit. Likewise, despite French uh, experience in Algeria and the British and Russian in Afghanistan, we had little comprehension of the depth of Islamic antipathy to foreign occupation. Nor, despite the tactics of a Daniel Boone character in our own history, a patriot named Francis Marion the Swamp Fox, who attacked British garrisons at night during the Revolutionary War and then vanished in South Carolina's swamps during the day, we had little sense for the effectiveness of asymmetric warfare. Policymakers. Policymakers have to recognize that political traumas of the moment are surface issues that can be understood only in relationship to underlying cultural bases. The customs, the history, the literature, the philosophy, and sometimes the myths of a country or people. Such considerations are critical to devising approaches to avoid conflict, to prosecuting a war if conflict cannot be avoided, and to ending any conflict in such a way as to lessen the prospect of a similar conflict emerging again. For decades, military strategists have talked about the need for an exit strategy when war is contemplated. But the mentality applied seems to have been almost exclusively concerned for logistics rather than the human heart and soul. To lead the world in this century, it is the human condition that we are going to have to give better understanding. We need to be aware that national security begins at home not only in relationship to the making of policy judgments, but with regard to the respect or lack thereof accorded diverse American cultural groups. The advancing of mutual respect is central to relations between states and peoples. As an immigrant society with family ties to every country around the, the globe, we are watched closely. How we speak and think about others and assimilate elements of our own society affect whether people around the world view us as a beacon of hope and opportunity or a wellstream of prejudice. For many, concern for civility seems either unimportant or sanctimonious. Actually, civility is the heart of civilization. It provides the prospect of avoiding, dampening, even resolving conflict, whether in the neighborhood or the international arena. 
Civility is not simply or principally about manners. It doesn't mean that spirited advocacy is to be avoided. Indeed, argumentation is a social good. Without argumentation, there's a tendency to dogmatism, even tyranny. What civility does require is a willingness to consider respectfully the views of others with an understanding that we are all connected and rely on each other. Seldom is there only one proper path determinable by one individual or one political party. Public decision making simply doesn't lend itself to certitude. This is why humility is a valued character trait and why civility is a central ingredient of civil society. Citizens should be expected to disagree vigorously with each other and take their differences to the ballot box. But the outcome that matters most in the wake of an election is whether despite differences, the prevailing candidates have the fortitude to work together for the common good. A government of, by, and for the people is obligated to conduct the nation's business in a manner that respects dissenting versions and those who hold them. If all men are created equal, surely it follows that everyone is entitled to lend their views to public policy. In this context, it's difficult not to be concerned whenever rancorous rhetoric is manipulated to divide the American family. Words reflect emotion as well as meaning. They clarify or cloud thought and energize action. Politics itself has high moments. It also has low moments. Higher moments have been characterized by expansions of political tolerance. Lower moments by debilitating political discourse, often accentuated with racial, ethnic, and religious overtones. In the history of the public, there have been more troubling challenges than we're confronted with today. And in world affairs, more egregious words have incited mankind to greater misdeeds than America has experienced. Nevertheless, the caustic labeling of public officials as fascist or con communist, and the toying with hints of history-blind radicalism, the notion of secession, is deeply troubling. One might ask, what problem is there with a bit of political hyperbole? The logic is the warning. If 400,000 American soldiers gave their lives to defeat fascism, if tens of thousands were lost holding communism at bay, and even more died in a civil war to define and preserve the Union, isn't it a citizen's obligation to apply perspective to wars, to words that contain warring implications? There is, after all, a difference between holding a particular tax or spending or health care view and asserting that an American who supports another approach or is a member of a different political party is an advocate of an ism of hate that encompasses gulags and concentration camps. Some frameworks of thought define rival ideas, others enemies. The poet Walt Whitman <coughs> once described America as an athletic democracy, and what he meant was that politics of his era was rugged, vigorous, and spirited. Anti-immigrant, especially anti-Catholic sentiment and toleration for human degradation implicit in slavery characterized more than a little of 19th century American thought in many of our social structures. Indeed, violence was a part of 19th century political manners. Uh, as the press has noted repeatedly this last year, in 1804, Vice President Aaron Burr shot dead our greatest Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, for suggesting that Burr was despicable in a duel that might be described as an act of legalized incivility. Half a century later, Congressman Preston Brooks of South Carolina wandered over to the Senate floor and caned unconscious Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, who was holding forth on the immorality of the Kansas-Nebraska Act and its sanctioning of slavery in an expanding part of the Union. So uncivil behavior is nothing new. What is new are transformative changes in communications technology in American politics and the issues facing mankind. While not as dramatic a rupture as existed in the 19th century, evidence is mounting and polls confirm that America has entered a period of intensing polarization. Citizens have lost confidence in many institutions of society and are becoming more disrespectful of their leaders, other faith systems, and each other. 
feisty position taking the media reflects the angst-ridden views of the public and in turn implicitly gives license to rancorous, socially divisive assertions across the land. The reinforcing phenomena of press uh, more or increasingly pandering to political consistencies and constituencies in that increasingly uh, polarized uh, for whatever reason uh, accentuates this whole group of issues and their dichotomies and more importantly uh, creates attitudinal rifts between the political parties. Part of this circumstance is tied to the weakest part of the American democratic system, which is the primary process. In legislative primaries, where a small percentage of the electorate, usually less than 5%, control the choice of candidates for the two major parties, the ideological edges over, routinely overwhelm, overwhelm the citizen center. The consequence of nominating con candidates at the edge of the, of the political system is particularly traumatic for legislative bodies. Maintaining partisan or ideological consistency rather than seeking common good becomes a two-sided mantra. Compromise was once considered a kind of old-fashioned art of politics, but today a legislator if he chooses to compromise on an important issue, becomes vulnerable to a primary challenge. His party will say, and activists in it will say, we need a real liberal or a real conservative to represent us. And so what you're seeing in Washington politics today is absolute rationality on the part of members of Congress in protecting their futures but irrationality in terms of what is the common good of the American people. In Western civilization, the, the most prophetic poem that people cite in troubled times is uh, the great uh, uh, second coming of, of W.B. Uh, Yeats, who suggested that the center cannot hold when the best lack all conviction and the worst are full of passionate intensity. Yeats was reacting to what can only be described as, as, as senseless carnage in World War I trench warfare. But the chaos of modernity has produced a crisis of perspective as well as values that give his words uh, potentially very large relevance today. Many of our traumas stem from the fast-changing nature of society, which has so many destabilizing elements. But some of the responsibility falls at the feet of politicians and their supporters who use inflammatory rhetoric and irresponsible advertising to divide the country. Candidates can prevail in elections by tearing down rather than uplifting, but if elected, they have a very difficult time uniting a splintered country. More insidious than the pervasive public incivility, by the way, of modern campaigns, is the polite incivility that is commonplace on Capitol Hill. And what I'm getting at is the electoral process is about more than what happens on election day. It's also about what happens between elections. Uh, to paraphrase Clausewitz, lawmaking is the continuation of politics in another form. Electoral politics never stops. It is just interrupted every year or two to count ballots. Civility and politeness are not synonymous. Indeed, in the quarters of the capital complex, polite words are sometimes more problematic than raucous ones. And let me give you this example that I've heard maybe hundreds of times in my life as I've walked to and fro uh, the uh, Capitol building in a congressional office and walking with colleagues and friends. Uh, it's, it's not a clean shot. Uh, there are a lot of people between an office building in the Capitol. Many are called lobbyists. And this is a typical con conversation. Congressman, as you know, we maxed out for you in the last election, and we and our allies sure hope to be able to do more than match that support this fall. But please understand that tomorrow, a bill of enormous importance to us is coming up on the floor, and we'd sure appreciate your support. And by the way, how are the wife and kids? 
politely stated, but there is no reference to the common good. Instead, coercively implied is a quasi-contractual relationship between an interest group and a public official. These implicit uncivil contracts can be coercive even if never discussed. Because corporatist power, newly magnified by the 2010 Citizens United Supreme Court ruling, can so easily reward a candidate or inflict political retribution. On the assumption, for instance, that politicians have an instinct for political survival, a key component of which is a desire to raise campaign revenues and suppress opponent treasuries. Why in a corporate political system would a politician want to stand up to the drug companies or gambling interests or investment banks if corporate monies can quickly be shoveled into the political trenches? Over our rather tumultuous history, the Supreme Court has generally been at the forefront of advancing justice and protecting the rule of law. But from time to time, our politics and the court have been out of step with our deepest ideals. It was the Supreme Court, after all, that in 1857, in a case called Dred Scott, denied human dignity and upheld slavery. Brazenly, in Citizens United, the court used parallel logic to the syllogism embedded in the Dred Scott decision. To justify slavery, the court in 1857 defined a class of human beings as private property. To magnify corporatist power a century and a half later, it defined a class of private property as people. Ironies abound. Despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary, the mid-19th century court could see no oppression in an institution that allowed individuals to be bought and sold. In the 2010 Citizens United ruling, despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary, it implicitly determined that corporations were somehow oppressed and had under the First Amendment the right to give corporate resources to candidates. To advance this sophist argument that more money equates to more democracy, it had to presume that money is speech and that a corporation is an individual. Well, where in Webster's or in any founding document are these equations made? How are corporations oppressed? Do corporate leaders not have free speech and the right to give campaign contributions just like any other citizen? Have they in the PACs that they currently control not been able to infuse billions, and I use this word carefully, billions in the political process? Is it an accident over the last generation of PAC-influenced politics that a definable shift of American wealth has taken place from the middle class to wealthier parties? Is there not a compelling case to return our democratic institutions to a status where the influence that matters is that of the voter rather than those who press conflict-inducing monies on the elected? Money may, in the widely understood pejorative sense, talk but it should never be equated with political speech. More money is not more democracy. Theft as well as justice is at issue. To the degree that corporate money can be construed as speech, it will for some be coerced rather than free. After all, to tap for political purposes purposes, the assets of shareholders, or by implication union members, because unions are defined as corporations under this law, more than a few of whom can be expected to hold different political judgments than management or their union leadership, to take from them is a taking of their assets and a diminution, diminution of their political rights. The notion that democratic government is about popular sovereignty rather than interest group politics is perhaps best expressed by two poets, Walt Whitman, Carl Sandburg, and our most poetic president, Abraham Lincoln. 
In his preface to Leaves of Grass, Whitman wrote that the genius of the United States is not best or most in its executives or legislatures, nor in its ambassadors or authors or colleges or churches or parlor parlors, nor even in its newspapers or inventors, but always most in the common people. Sandberg, too, harkened back to the voice of the people. I am the people, he wrote. The mob, the crowd, the masses. Do you know that all the great work of the world is done through me? In America's most trying moment, our 16th president did not go to Pennsylvania's battlefield to extol corporations, nor at Gettysburg did Lincoln celebrate his own virtues. He didn't think the world would much note or longer remember what he said. Rather, he suggested that the patriots who gave the last full measure of devotion would inspire their countrymen then and after, and that it remained for us the living to ensure that a government of, by, and for the people not perish from the earth. A corporation cannot vote. It cannot run for office. It's an artificial creation of the state, which in turn is a creation of the people. The inspiring words of our founders were about free men born with inalienable rights. It is they who speak. It's they who can assemble. It's they who are considered equal amongst each other. Holding that a corporation is a person with citizenship rights doesn't square with the Declaration of Independence. All men may be created equal in relation to each other, but not necessarily in relation to corporations or under Citizens United in relation to how corporations may empower some individual relative to others. There is no equality of individual and corporate personhood and no equality of individuals when one with multiple corporate ties may be able to trumpet a louder perspective than one with none or just a few. Multiple personality disorder may from time to time describe a candidate in regard to issues taken, stances taken, but it never was intended to find the political system itself. At our founding, propertyless people, propertyless people, as well as women and slaves, were denied the right to vote. And there was an original constitutional acceptance that slaves could be considered three-fifths of a person for legislative and electoral college apportionment. But none of our founders ever advanced the notion that one individual could be several persons and have magnified influence based on control of corporate assets. The arc of our history that is bent towards justice is suddenly, with the court decision, twisted back to that part of our constitutional heritage that was self-evidently unjust property considerations have again become accentuated in key aspects of citizenship. Granting to corporations the right to muscle further into the political fray is complicated by the fact that shareholding by sovereign wealth funds and foreign individuals and American corporations is substantial and growing. Foreign governments, citizens, and corporations are currently barred from making political contributions. Under the new ruling, they now would be able to influence explicitly or implicitly how American institutions exercise political power, whether through companies which they control as U.S. incorporated subsidiaries or through share ownership on American public exchanges. But the main casualty of Citizens United is idealism. The sacrifices Lincoln uh, inspired at our most trying moment had no reference to a union of, by, and for corporations. Rather, he spoke of an imperishable government of the people. At this time, when the country also needs to pull together, the Supreme Court has taken a path to magnify public cynicism. It is determined to protect moneyed influence peddling that not only squelches citizen speech, but eviscerates the capacity of citizens and policymakers to weigh competing views in a balanced way. Sandra Day O'Connor has recently taken on uh, the effort uh, to object to Citizens United, and she uses this as an example, a very interesting one. She wants all states that elect uh, their state judges uh, to do everything in their power to change this ruling. And she argues in states like Texas that interest groups will control the Supreme Court of Texas. Uh, and that she has in mind uh, particularly powerful interest groups in that state. 
But what's interesting to me is that a justice concern for justice issues really should think in larger terms as well. That is, the goal of advancing justice and the principles of equal justice under law applies to the making and administrating of laws, just as it does to their adjudication in the courtroom. Uh, in fact, I, at the risk of presumption, would suggest it might apply greater to legislative affairs than it does judicial. The reason I say this is that judiciousness in a judicial context means careful allegiance and interpretation of law and its constitutional framework. Judiciousness in a legislative context means concern for fairness. And the courts have to deal with what the legislative and executive branch brings to them. And that is where we as a country should be deeply, deeply concerned. Uh, the public senses that something's a kilter in the political system. It has a very difficult time defining what that is. And you don't see that well-defined in the movements of people upset. But what the Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street have in common is a sense that somehow the country has lost its sense of fairness. This is judiciousness, fairness. And we as a country are going to have to think through how it is that we bring it back. And do you bring it back by putting and infusing more money in the political process, or do you bring it back by curbing conflicted money in the political process? And to me, this should be the unifying concern of everyone that's rebelling about what they feel has been happening in America over the last several decades. Uh, and here I just want to, from a former participant's point of view, stress that many good people enter politics, but they enter politics only to find that the system causes the, row load, the low road to become the one most traveled. Politicians routinely develop conflicts that do not technically rise to a legal standard of corruption because legislative law and now judicial fiat have weakened that standard. Speech is thus at issue from two perspectives. At one end, uncivil speech must be protected by the court, but filtered by the public. And at the other end, corporate speech must not, must not be allowed to silence the voice of the people. Higher political standards require, require law that opens up rather than closes down democratic participation. Thank you very much. I, I, well, thank you. I, I apologize coming to you with such an awful cold. I uh, had a hard time getting through this talk, but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Yes, sir. an aspect of it, but it, it, it's also a reason why uh, we have to expand primary participation. Um, the, uh, uh, it is true in the House of Representatives about 80 to 85 percent of the seats are relatively safe for one party or the other, except in explosive years where change might, might come about that's greater than that. Uh, I, <laughs> as uh, Derek knows, 
sometimes give a talk when I when I express myself in in uh, course terms. That is, when I uh, left Congress and entered teaching, I developed 40 or 50 two-minute courses in, in political theory. And I'm going to give you real quickly two. The first I call Political Science 101, and it's very simple. If you take the last generation, we're about a third Democratic, a third Republican, a th third no party, which means half of a third, which is a six, that number of people control the Republican and Democratic Party's candidates and platforms, one-sixth of the American people. But if in primaries, on average, at most one in four participate in legislative primaries, often one in eight, sometimes one in 12, if you take big participation, you have to multiply one-fourth times one-sixth, or one-twenty-fourth control the Republican Party, one-twenty-fourth the Democratic Party. And so you ask yourself, who is that 4%? In the Democratic Party, it's been fairly consistent. It's a fairly old-fashioned liberalism. Uh, union members, teachers, uh, et cetera. In the Republican Party, it's undergone some transformation. When I entered politics, it was very Goldwater-like. Uh, today, it's, it's much more social conservatism. But what it all means is, if you go back to the founders, one of the assumptions of the founders was that uh, your national legislature would be composed of people representing all walks of life. And they were talking about farmers versus merchants versus manufacturers versus sailors, et cetera. Uh, in American politics, we talk more about moderate, conservative, liberal. But at the moment, the most underrepresented part of the United States public in the national legislature is the majoritarian center. That is an extraordinary phenomenon. And how do you do anything about it? It's, it, 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 it's, it's, it's an aspect. Uh, the state of Iowa has a wonderful model. I sometimes give lectures about it to people from other states where we have a nonpartisan commission and triggers that would cause the state Supreme Court to cause redistricting if, if one of the options of the nonpartisan process doesn't come to fruition. But uh, it's, it's, it's not the only problem. I mean, for example, sometimes quite naturally uh, a district is going to be one party or another. I mean, you take a, a rural state out west, they're pretty darn Republican. You have a hard time carving out a Democratic district. You take an inner city, you have a hard time carving out a Republican district. And so there are a, a number of districts that are naturally one party or another, and then you have circumstances where uh, the powers that be uh, use manipulative politics to try to carve out more seats for their own. And we all know of examples. Uh, and sometimes there's a circumstance, I remember in the last redistricting in the state of Illinois, the Republican and Democratic leader in the House from the state uh, got together and very graciously, uh, Democrats gave uh, Republican precincts to neighboring Republican areas and very graciously Republicans gave up Democratic precincts to Democratic uh, neighboring congressmen, and it was a, a pro-incumbent cabal. Uh, but was, it wasn't partisan, it was pro-incumbent. Uh, and so you get that sort of circumstance, too. Uh, and so I think the case for nonpartisan redistricting is real, and, and that there ought to be a much more attention to the concept of competitiveness as a, as a, a social good. Uh, but. Uh, it, it goes way beyond that, and uh, that's only one part of the circumstance, uh, and we just have to participate more. I'm going to just give this second course, so real quickly, because it's a tag on to it. Uh, in this second course, I call Political Science 102, and everybody understands half of it, and few think about the second half. And the half that everybody understands is if two people, this, if these two ladies both run for president, one is a Republican, one is a Democrat. Everybody knows the Republican moves to the right in the primary, and if nominated, will try to scoot to the center, and the Democrat vice versa. But in legislative seats, the first part is true. If you're running for Congress, the Democrat has to move to the left in the primary, the Republican has to move to the right. 
but there is no subsequent scoot to the center. And that relates in partial measure to the fact that every district, or so many districts are one party, that the only vulnerability of these two people becomes in a primary, not the general election. And so if you go to Washington, you have no incentive whatsoever to compromise with the person of the other party. And if you do, it, you're gonna have a group of constituents that say you're not a real Democrat or a real Republican or a real conservative or a real liberal, we're gonna throw you out. And so you're finding your Congress operate quite rationally from their individual perspectives. Yes, sir. Well, this, this is an issue uh, for every state to decide. Uh, it's also an issue in a state like Pennsylvania that has enormous implications for the national election uh, because big states uh, carry a lot of electoral votes. And in a winner-take-all system, uh, generally speaking, all things being equal, Pennsylvania might be considered to be likely democratic. Uh, in all things unequal, it might not be. Uh, but uh, what obviously is being contemplated is an advantage to the Republicans in this case if, if you go to a district by district vote because it'll end up with some electoral votes for the Republicans, some for the Democrats. Uh, now, uh, in Nebraska, it would be uh, 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 pro-democratic to have the the current system where they are divided by congressional districts because historically one of the three might be democratic and so democrats would get one electoral vote uh, and so you have the opposite phenomenon uh, but this is a a circumstance that i every uh, decade gets talked about a little bit and a lot is your own personal judgment and uh, unrelated to one party's advantage or, over another, you have a, a little greater decentralization of the Electoral College. By the way, there is a movement afoot uh, that is uh, led by a non-political figure, a, a engineer at Stanford University who came up with a system by which without constitutional amendment, the current electoral college system might be upended. Uh, and there are groups that have been pushing this, led by a former Republican candidate for president named John B. Anderson, who ran for president in 1980. And the system that the Stanford engineer came up, which several states have adopted, uh, is that if enough states that are larger were to pass a law that said that all of the electoral college votes will go to the national candidate that got the most votes and then stipulated that this law would not take effect un unless and until states that represented a majority of the electoral college also passed the same law. Uh, and that would have an effect of changing uh, the current electoral college without uh, uh, a constitutional amendment. It, it's philosophically of interest. It's also kind of a backdoor approach that might make one feel kind of uncomfortable about. And so it's worth thinking. Uh, personally, uh, I've always thought the League of Women Voters had a good case to be made to simply change the Constitution and go to a presidential uh, direct election. Uh, and that way one avoids uh, any prospect of uh, chaos that almost occurred in, in the year 2000. And you might say, what do I mean? Because we had some chaos in the year 2000. Uh, but if uh, it looked as if there was not a majority of the Electoral College for either George Bush or Al Gore, 
uh, it would have gone uh, to, to a very complicated set of voting involving the House of Representatives and the Senate, and complicated voting in that the House, under the current constitutional arrangements, would have to vote by state. Uh, and so let's say a state had uh, five congressmen and three were Democratic and two were Republican, presumably the five or, or the, all the electoral votes of the, of the state would go to the majority. Then what happens if you have two and two? Uh, and so you have a real uh, 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 discombobulation that could occur in this process. Uh, and so the, the, there is a, a case for guaranteed uh, certitude to go to direct election of the president. Uh, but that takes a constitutional amendment, which requires a, a two-thirds vote of the House, the Senate, and three-quarters of the state ratifying. And there is a strong assumption that uh, more than a quarter of the states would object uh, because there's a traditional small state desire uh, to keep the Electoral College. Yes, ma'am. Well, uh, there are only uh, two ways you change Citizens United. One is a constitutional amendment. Uh, and then you might slightly chip away at it through legislation. Um, I sometimes, with some temerity, suggested something that no one else would approve of, but I, I will give it to you just, uh, it's pretty extreme. Uh, that we ought to pass a law that says that uh, corporations can't give money in the political process unless they have the signed write-off of every shareholder. <laughs> now, one of, one of, the, one of the, the downsides of that approach is that, that closely held corporations wouldn't have a problem with that. Uh, and, but a large public company, it would be inconceivable. Yes. Uh, you define sort of a problem, but I wonder who you think there are leaders that might get us over this sort of malaise and and what leaders should we John Q. Public? What could we be doing to help our country move on? You know, we're not Sam Day O'Connor, but well, I, I I I think participation is the answer is the antidote to everything, uh, and. Uh, I was kind of appalled to read this last week that some groups are going to be uh, trying to disrupt the caucuses, which I think is uh, as anti-democratic as you could get. Uh, although I, I frankly am one of the few that prefer a primary system. Uh, and uh, I mentioned to a chap earlier today, I even have one minor bit of reform I'd like to suggest to the Democratic Party that no one is in a at the risk of presumption, I, I might tell you what it is. There's a different set of rules for the Republican caucus and the Democratic caucus. And in one sense, the Republican is more Democratic. And let me explain this. If any of you in this room were approached by a newly democratizing state, a country, and were to say, how do we put together a democracy? You would talk about the need for uh, candidates and ballots and secret voting. <laughs> Everyone would agree. Uh, and, and if anyone disagrees with what I just said, secret voting, I'd like to have you show your hands. However, in the Democratic Party's caucuses, there is a system by which you stand and tell people who you're going to vote for. And I will tell you, that causes people not to come. And the caucus system is designed not to attract people, but magnet-wise to hold people from coming. It is an insider circumstance. And I'm going to give you a quote that's a private quote. Uh, my closest friend in political life was a Democratic presidential candidate named Bill Bradley. Bill ran for President of the United States in the year 2000. 
in the Iowa caucuses in Elcor Beatum. Elcor is, is a friend. We came into Congress together. I have a great deal of respect for him. Sometimes in politics, two really fine candidates don't exactly like each other. Bill is absolutely convinced that he would have won the Iowa caucuses if there had been a secret vote. And you might say, what do I mean? Well, the unions in Iowa determined to back Al Gore. And so that puts a lot of people on the spot. You're an active member of an association. You come to a caucus. Your leadership says you have to vote a given way. I consider that anti-democratic, and the Democratic Party of Iowa has to think that through. Now, uh, an analog in the Republican caucus would be, uh, let's say, um, five people from a given company come, and the president of the company favors one candidate. Might that not put some coercion on the other candidates? Uh, and it might. And that's why the Republican caucuses, they pass out little slips of paper. And you write down, you know, in this election, Romney or Bachman or what, Newt or whatever it might be, and you fold them up and they go up and then people count the ballots. That is a, a much fairer system. Uh, and I'm going to end with one other comment that might seem odd to you. My, one of my most memorable experiences, the first year I ran for Congress, I went door to door in some rural areas and, and about five miles from uh, Mount Pleasant, I go up uh, to a small farmhouse and uh, an older man comes to the door and I explain I'm a candidate and I had a little tiny card and I'd appreciate consideration. And then his wife came up and let's say it's Maple and John and John says, what party are you? And I said, well, I'm, I'm a Republican, sir. I say this very hesitantly. And he said, that'd be good. We, Mabel and me, we only vote Republican. And then there's a phone call, and John goes back. And sometimes in life, when you're a stranger, you get responses from people that no one else would get. And Mabel says to me, I, I, I have something to tell you. <laughs> and I said, yes, Mabel. Don't tell John. Said, yes, Mabel. We have this farm. John do farming. I do books. We would not have this farm if it wasn't for a man named Franklin Roosevelt. I never vote Republican in my life. <laughs> but don't tell John. Well, what if they were to go to a caucus? I mean, this is, this is a very old-fashioned thing. I mean, and, and it, it's, it's probably large, well, it's large, it's, it was largely behind the wayside then. But there are incidents of this sort of thing. I mean, people like their privacy. And they might not tell someone how they voted. That's a great American right. You don't have to tell a soul who you voted for. And I, I would really strongly recommend the Democratic Party consider this dilemma. Yes, ma'am. Excuse me. That that's that's valid, and and I and to be fair, let me let me just tell you a complaint in, in my Republican Party. There have uh, been half a dozen times in my life that an older lady that I know is very Republican has said to me, Jim, I'm, I I say, do you know who you're going to support? And they say, well, we're not going to the caucuses, and I say, why not? And someone will say, I'm tired of being told 
that I'm not religious enough. I mean, that's, I mean, so you get this. Now you, but on the same token, uh, one of the reasons that you have to take with a little bit of grain of salt, my strong feelings on this, is that uh, tradition is a very important thing and that parties have the right to design under actually court rulings their system however they want to do it. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I happen to think you can honor a system with some change too. Uh, but uh, there is a great collegiality and uh, there is an aspect of, of, of fun of, among insiders particularly because the Democrats have this rule that if you don't get 15% of the vote, I think it's 15, isn't it? Uh, then uh, the people who are part of the candidate that got 7% uh, in a revote have to choose someone else, and that person is eliminated from the second round. And that's a, a, a structured game. Uh, I've often felt, and I don't know if it's the right sense or not, that I feel sorry for some of the candidates. I mean, let's. Let's say a candidate has spent a year campaigning in Iowa and gets 11% of the vote at a bunch of caucuses and maybe 18 at another, uh, but they don't get a full reflection of, of how well they tried and worked. And uh, I, I don't think it's wrong. There's, there's no big deal in, in pressing to eliminate candidates for a second round, but you can do that with a secret vote too. Uh, and you can just have a second vote with a set of 12 candidates to have four or five or six or whatever it might be at a given caucus. But I, I've never known exactly why, but my Democratic friends say, but it's fun, uh, and, we, and we like it. Uh, and, and it. And it may be fun plus tradition is worthy of uh, giving the benefit of the doubt. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, Jean. Jim, I wonder if you would say a word or two about the role that, uh, played by the media in um, exacerbating the dynamics of polarization that you described. Do you think that the media and media does that? Because that's when grievance is often voiced by both the Tea Party and the Occupy Wall Street protesters. And uh, if, if you do think that's part of the story, uh, what suggestions or recommendations would you have about what uh, can be done about that? Uh, ordinary citizens or other groups? Well, first, I, I think we ought to put this story a little bit in historical context. In the 19th century, every town had at least two newspapers and often more. And one would be, let's say, Whig and Democratic. Another might be uh, German or Italian or Jewish or whatever, an, an, another immigrant kind of group. Uh, uh, and these papers were vibrantly partisan. Uh, in many respects, and the rhetoric was much worse than today's. Uh, then, when the 20th century hit, there were a series of staggered phenomena. And the first was that uh, newspapers uh, came to consolidate. Uh, and as you try to direct yourself to a larger audience, you get a little more balance. And so a newspaper might stay Republican or stay Democratic. But many newspapers would, on their editorial pages, in order to not offend constituencies, have a Republican or conservative columnist and a liberal columnist to, to, to have some balance. Uh, and then when the radio hit, it immediately had very large audiences. And so uh, it was, on the whole, much more balanced. Now, you had examples in the 30s of Father Coughlin and others that were pretty extreme. But uh, there was an effort at greater balance. On television, when you had a few stations, the famous three, uh, each truly competed to be the most balanced. And the public didn't always think they were balanced, but they truly thought they were and truly strove to be. Then you have, uh, as uh, we get into the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, this, this, this steady movement towards more stations uh, and then more sources, uh, and then a decline of advertising revenue for stations. And 
and the newspapers. And so what it means is that every newspaper in America that used to be thick and the number of investigative reporters used to be large, they're now almost non-existent. Uh, and that newspapers are getting skinnier basically because newspapers are no longer particularly profitable. And, and that causes great angst for all of us that love newspapers. Then on the media side of uh, TV as well as radio, uh, there was a recognition when you have so many, nobody can make much money. But if you picked an audience, you have a chance for doing much better. And so uh, instead of where we have journalism schools that we developed in this country that had never existed before, and we all learned that all journalism schools teach who, what, where, when, why as a focus of how you write a story, that the new mantra became how do you appeal to a particular kind of constituency? And so you have uh, this, uh, perhaps led early by uh, Fox, but copied by MSNBC, two groups trying to attract different constituencies. Uh, and there is, the, the question becomes, if you're an editor for one of them, uh, how do you advance a creed? How do you advance an appeal to this constituency? And it becomes self-reinforcing. Uh, and that, uh, just changes everything and has changed everything. Uh, and that doesn't mean that any one of these stations are bad people or whatever. They are doing probably out of convictions, but also uh, with stations that have a mercantilist uh, eye as well, and, and you have a different way. Now, uh, the good news is that one of the great changes that occur, and because we always look at the negative, but particularly symbolized in the university community, there is not a soul in this room that doesn't spend more than a little part of the day deleting. And what I mean by that is that everybody in this room has an option of seeing incredibly deep, thoughtful articles on every newsworthy subject about any part of the world. And these are deeper than one would have gotten in newspapers. And it's my view that we have, everyone talks about social divides. And you've got rich, poor, you've got Protestant, Catholic, you know, whatever divide you want to, ethnic versus ethnic. But one of the great true divides that really is appearing in American society and in a sense, every society in the world is between those who, first of all, have crossed the digital divide, either because of ability or access to digital technology. And then secondly, of those who have crossed the digital divide, between those who choose to look for sources from a variety of places and look at sources of depth, and those who choose single perspective choices, and an awful lot of people everywhere, uh, whether you think of Al Jazeera, whether you think of a uh, given media structure in this country, are choosing a, a, a given kind of contact. Now, one study I read that I thought was really interesting claimed that uh, on the Fox MB MSNBC divide, they found that people who watched Fox watched a very different set of entertainment than people who watched MSNBC as well. And there was only one commonality. Both sides in equal numbers watched House. <laughs> I, 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 I have no idea why, but it just a phenomenon. Well, anyway, let me take one more question. We'll bring it to a close. Yes, sir. Thank you, Jay. Uh, uh, a lot of the, the common leaders, including yourself, have talked about the uh, growth of digital media, but it sort of seems to me, having lived this long as I have, which is not as long as you have, obviously. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>
comes from AM radio. So if I turned on the AM radio in my car going home and went from one source of the dial to the other and went to talk radio shows, what would I hear and what side of the political spectrum would it represent? That was a moment in history. Well, I, I think you've asked a rhetorical question, sir. <laughs> And, uh, well, people have found there's a great following for uh, certain kinds of talk shows. Uh, but if you think that those might be slightly irresponsible, uh, you, if you do, you've never listened to shortwave radio. Uh, and there is a group in shortwave radio that is, is uh, apparently uh, leans towards a word called conspiracy theory uh, on many subjects, but uh, there are also wonderful shortwave radio people that aren't part of that. I mean, I don't want to make any uh, 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 blanket statement, and I don't think it's we want to make a blanket statement about AM, but uh, certainly there's a difference between uh, um, some radio talk shows and, let's say, uh, public broadcasting, and everybody understands that. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. I think we all have a lot of food for thought after this evening's discussion. I would like to invite you all to the sessions tomorrow, which are going to be at the Sheraton all day. They're all free and open to the public. We're going to start in the, mo in the morning hearing from Representative Lopesack and hearing some of his perspectives. Then we're going to go to our keynote for the day, which is Mike Goucher, who is here and going to be talking about the interesting activities that are going on in Wisconsin. He's from Marquette Law School, which should be very good. We're also going to have a, a panel talking about Citizens United and talking about the campaign's finance and the impact that that is having from a variety of different perspectives a panel on women in political discourse, a panel on the caucuses and the two state party chairs, and then also one on the traditional media with a group of journalists. So please invite you to come out if you can and invite others to come and join us as well. Thank you very much. Yes.